All right, today we're talking about the French Revolution. We have two daily objectives. Number one, explain why the bourgeoisie in France led the revolution. And number two, explain why other countries in Europe saw the French Revolution as a threat. So Louis XIV is the symbol of the absolute monarch. He built the Palace of Versailles. He forced the nobles to live with him. He just decreased the power of the nobles. He supported the arts. He became the Sun King. And French became the lingua franca of Europe. So Louis XIV is the ideal absolute monarch. And after his death, his descendants, including Louis XVI, which we'll learn about in just a second, continues to bring all the power to themselves so that no one else has anything. The bourgeoisie don't have power, the nobles don't have power, the military doesn't have power, just the king. And this is ultimately going to be a problem as people begin reading the books of the Enlightenment. So, we have the Estates General. So the Estates General is the legislative body of France in this time period. So basically the way it works is the population of France was divided into three estates. The Estates General is made up of these three estates. The first is the Catholic clergy, not the Protestants. They don't care about the Protestants. They only care about the Catholics. The second are the nobles. The third is everyone else. That is 97% of the population. So the bourgeoisie, the rich merchants and traders, the commoners, the peasants, everybody else is in the third estate. So the third estate has just as many representatives to this legislative body as do the nobles and the clergy. So the bourgeoisie are the unofficial leaders of the third estate. Now this is mostly merchants. Um, that were rich as a result of overseas colonies and overseas trade. These bourgeoisie were highly educated in Enlightenment thought, and they wanted political power, but the king, the nobles, and the Catholic Church, church all refused. So Louis the Sixteenth, as some over here on the right, this is the I believe it's the great great grandson of Louis the Fourteenth. Uh, he and his queen Marie Antoinette were lavish spenders. Um, they spent lots and lots of money building up the Palace of Versailles. Um, uh, buying themselves clothing, buying ridiculous food. Not to mention Louis the Sixteenth inherited a large amount of debt from his ancestors, especially Louis the Fourteenth. Um, he even, in, fa in fact, Louis the Sixteenth doubled this debt, trying to help the thirteen American colonies gain independence from England, which was successful. That's why the United States is a country. But eventually, the banks refused to keep giving money to Louis the Sixteenth. You've had enough. You're not paying it back. We refuse to give you any more money. In an effort to try and get some more money, he wants to raise taxes. But according to French law, one of the few powers the king does not have is the ability to raise taxes by himself. He has to call the Estates General. So he calls the Estates General and says, Estates General, I need to raise taxes. What should we do? So this third estate, led by the bourgeoisie, remember this is 97% of the population, uses this as an opportunity to overthrow the government. They declare themselves the new National Assembly and ratify a new French constitution, which guarantees basic rights to French people and overthrows the king. The king no longer has power or say so in France. The people of Paris rise up and storm the Bastille. This is a Bastille. It looks like a castle, but it's actually a prison. Um, and in the Bastille, there were hundreds and hundreds of people who had been imprisoned from debt. So back in the day, if you had too much debt and couldn't pay it, you would actually throw you in jail. Um, they did not think it was fair that the king could have all this debt and go unpunished, and then all of the normal people had to go to prison for debt. So they stormed the Bastille, they free people, and this is really the first sign that the French monarchy is done. We've got something new going on in France, all being led by the bourgeoisie because they want political power, because they're reading the books of the Enlightenment. By August 4, 1789, the first and second estates are gone. The king is deposed, and technically all French people are equal. This leads us to the reign of terror. So eventually these French rebels led by the bourgeoisie um, start paying respects to this guy named Maximilien Robespierre, this guy over here. Uh, Maximilien Robespierre is afraid that the king will reestablish himself and begins what is called the Reign of Terror. Basically, they start rounding up nobles and anyone who is loyal, known as a royalist, to the king and starts executing them. They use this device called the guillotine to behead people while they are alive. They march them up, they drop the blade, it cuts off their head. They kill lots and lots and lots of people who get accused of being royalists. 
On January 12, 1793, the king himself, Louis XVI, is beheaded by Maximilian Robespierre during the Reign of Terror. The revolution, which started over equality and the ideals of the Enlightenment, become very, very bloody. So this is a picture of the guillotine over here, and this guy just got beheaded, which is kind of cool, and here's his head on a spike. So the kings and queens in Europe looked upon the French Revolution with fear. They believed that the French Revolution could spread to their own countries. They're like, oh my god, this king just got beheaded by his own people. This is not good. This enlightenment thing is scary. What should we do? So they all band together, and they invade France in an effort to reestablish the monarchy. Even though they don't like Louis the Sixteenth and the Bourbons very much, they like the king much more than they like the crazy the crazy commoners, and they like the king much more than their own commoners at home than they have to worry about. So this is why they invade France. Um, the war is very brutal. Um, it's very vicious. France is on the edge of losing, and ultimately France calls the first draft. They basically say every man who is capable. Come, get weapons, we're going to train you, and you're going to be part of the French army. Over 300,000 Frenchmen join the French army as part of the draft. And the key here is they join willingly. Why do they join willingly? Because of the rise of nationalism. Nationalism is a very important word that you will see for the rest of the semester. Nationalism is, is pride in one's nation. Nation being a group of people, not necessarily a country. So Frenchmen are proud of being French. They're proud of these new rights they've gotten as a result of the, of, of the Enlightenment, and they don't want to see those rights go away. They don't want to see the king come back. So because they are nationalistic, because they are proud of the French nation, because they are proud of their new country that belongs all to them, they rise up, they join the French army, and eventually they beat back the kings and queens of Europe. So for a very short period of time, France is going to be a republic, just like the United States. Um, there's this document called the Declaration of the Rights of Man that gets published, which basically it's kind of like our Bill of Rights in the United States. It guarantees certain rights to French people, especially the natural rights of life, liberty, and property. So for a very, very short period of time, France has been transformed from an absolute monarchy to a republic where technically all French people are free and, and equal. Unlike the United States, the French Republic is not going to last, and a man by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte is going to reform the French Republic into a weird, different version of an absolute monarchy. Over here we see the types of government. We've learned about all of these before, but realize this is where France was, specifically the absolute kind, and then it moves into a republic, and then it's going to kind of sort of move back. Take a few minutes, answer your two daily objectives.